This is Talk Back with Peter Christian and John King. 721-1290 or 1-800-568-5309. This is News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 101.5 FM. News Talk KGVO, Missoula's news and weather station. Talk Back is brought to you by the Mustard Seed Asian Cafe in Southgate Mall, by Kootenai Creek Village, the maintenance-free active adult community in Stevensville. Call 777-5387. By Diggit Excavating, bringing 30 years of excellence to every job. For all your excavation needs, call Glenn at 214-4292. Transport Equipment, your headquarters for RV service maintenance and repair. Transport Equipment, just south of the Y, next to the Axman, 9300 Inspiration Drive, 541-9097. Bull's Eyewear, where they offer some of the lowest prices in town on contact lenses. See Lynette at Bull's Eyewear at 2910 South Reserve. By Nissan Hyundai of Missoula, they're under new management and offering rebates, discounts, and 0% financing on a huge selection of inventory. Check them out. They're on Brooks near Southgate Mall. And by Selway Armory, 2825 Stockyard Road, Unit E6. More guns and ammo than anyone in Missoula, and the best prices in Montana. Montana's premier firearms dealer. The views and opinions expressed on TalkBack are not those of the staff, management, or advertisers. All right. Well, we're going to have a special edition of the Montana World Affairs Council today. Bob Seidenschwartz is joining me in studio. Catherine is running our phone lines this morning. And we have a special guest uh, direct from the Bill Maher show, right? (laughs) I think I saw Raheel not too long ago on Bill Maher. Uh, We have Raheel Raza on the air. Bob, I was hoping you could give us a quick introduction. Yeah, I want to get through this. Uh, there's so much to say, but uh, time is short. So um, Rahil Raza is a public speaker, consultant of interfaith and intercultural diversity, documentary filmmaker, freelance journalist, and founder of SAMA, Sacred Arts and Music Alliance. She was appointed to and served three years on the Public Service Committee for Ontario College for Teachers. Raza started, growing, uh, started writing at a young age because she grew up in a culture where women were supposed to be seen and not heard. Traveling extensively throughout the Middle East, Europe, Far East, and North America, Raza brings a fresh new global perspective to her mandate. There is unity in diversity. An outspoken advocate for gender equality and an activist for women's rights internationally, she has appeared many times in print, radio, television media to reveal and debate Canadian issues related to media diversity, gender, and immigrants. Raza has received many awards for her work to build bridges of understanding. She is the first recipient of Toronto's Constance Hamilton Award and the first South Asian woman to narrate a CBC documentary on Passion and I. I could go on, but let's bring our guest on. And yes, John, I was watching TV about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and Bill Maher is on, and there's Raza as his guest. So we've got a celebrity on the radio with us today. Well, welcome to the show, Raheel. Thank you. Good morning. It's wonderful to be on the show. Thank you. Now, I know what Bob has. He actually does have a ledger full of questions for you. So, Bob, yes, I, I don't want to waste any time. Let's, let's you get, get right, right to him. Um, Rahil, there's, um, there's a, a video that I have seen several times, the untold story of Muslim opinions and demographics. Would you please describe to the audience what this is about? And, of course, uh, from there, no doubt we'll have plenty of questions for you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, This is a short 14-minute documentary. It's called By the Numbers. It has been made by the Tarian Project, and it is actually a mind-boggling study of human nature, uh, how the human race in this century has uh, come to these large numbers. It is based on a Pew uh, poll titled The World's Muslims, Religion, Politics, and Society. And it is a survey of 67% of the Muslim world. It is important to clarify that. They could not go and do research in Saudi Arabia, Iran, and China. Obviously, we know why. And so the, the demographics are based on this. And the reason this has come about is because we have two extremes in the world today. We have those who say that there is no problem in the Muslim world, and we have those like Trump who say that the entire Muslim world is a problem. So this is something that uh, we need to have a conversation about because uh, neither one of them is correct. Somewhere in between is the truth, the balance, that, uh, you know, blaming or defending Islam is not the solution. We have a problem. We have large numbers of uh, people who have been infected by this virus, by this extremist ideology, and uh, we need to be able to address these issues uh, you know, very clearly without uh, being politically correct. 
So, so this is the this documentary is a result of that few uh, research polls. So, uh, Rahil, one of the things that it's happening even right here in Western Montana is there's discussions and debates about uh, the immigrants coming from uh, Syria and relocating some of these people here. And we've had in the Bitterroot Valley, in the Flathead, uh, the county commissioners with a vote have absolutely said, no, we do not want the Syrians coming here, which, of course, is, is in many respects is saying we don't want Muslims coming here in Missoula. We've had demonstrations for and against. So this issue is alive and well right here in our own backyard. So when we're talking about this video that you're describing, give us a little bit more detail, because some people believe the entire Islamic, war, Islamic world is aflame in terms of radicalism. And, and that is not the case. But there is more support than people may understand or realize. So give us some insight into how large is this support? Uh, where are the various uh, groups in terms of their thoughts and discussions coming from? Okay, so let me begin by first differentiating between Islam as a spiritual journey, which is what I follow, which is what millions of Muslims follow. You know, they want to do their 95 jobs. They're not terrorists. They're not extremists. And then there is Islamism, which is political Islam. And there is a great differentiation because this ideology of Islamism is just like fascism or Marxism or communism. And you know that when these were alive and well, the whole global community banded together to fight them. However, it's unfortunate that when it comes to Islamism, which is also a violent ideology, people are afraid to speak out. They have been told that they are racist or bigots if they speak out. So this, um, by the numbers, the documentary uh, gives everyone some clear statistics to, to speak with. It's not a documentary to create hate or bigotry, because remember, hate and bigotry doesn't solve the problem. Uh, if it did, perhaps it would have been fine, but it doesn't solve this problem. Now, you're talking about refugees. So the, in this particular documentary, by the numbers, we see um, that there were, you know, in, in Europe, when refugees have come, there have been mercenaries and extremists who have snuck in with them. So my personal feeling is that we never want to lose our humanity. We never want to be less than compassionate and merciful to people who are less fortunate than ourselves. And there are genuine refugees in this horrible war that's taking place in Syria. So we shouldn't close our hearts and minds to the idea that as human beings, it is our moral and ethical responsibility to help others. However, we should not be naive about it either. You know, when refugees are being taken in, they need to be background checks, and we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are evil people who want to use um, anything and anybody to clamber on board and to come and harm the West. Rahil. So we need to be conscious of that. All right, we got to go to a break. Uh, we've got Rahil Raza on the line. We also have one line open. Maryland's next in queue, but after that, uh, we can get your voice on. Give us a call at 721-1290. That's 721-1290. We'll be back after this quick break. Millions of people have trouble with unhealthy hair, skin, and nails. These problems often stem from deficiencies in specific vitamins and nutrients. When deficiency occurs, your body has no choice but to shut down the areas that are fueled by those nutrients. Vitality Nutrition has a solution called Bonita to help you grow more healthy hair, skin, and nails, plus provides the necessary components to help keep collagen regenerating and keep your immune function at its peak performance. Vitality Nutrition at 2400 Brook Street or call 549-1333. Spring is sprung. Get outside and enjoy that sunshine. And remember, if you get hurt or overdo it, the Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic is open seven days a week. For those unplanned injuries or when you're just not feeling great, visit the Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic at 2230 North Reserve in the Northgate Plaza. Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic, open seven days a week, and they even offer x-rays so you can get answers right away. Located at 2230 North Reserve in the Northgate Plaza, open every day to get you back where you belong. Mark Don Madness is here. Dave Smith Motors will help you slam dunk a low price. This isn't a game. Dave Smith is the real deal. Receive a super low price today on over 1,500 new Chryslers, Dodge, Jeeps, Rams, and certified pre-owned vehicles. Slam dunk a low price during Ram Truck Month and enter to win a new 2015 Ram 2500 Crew Cab SLT 4x4. Call 800-635-8000 or go online to davesmith.com. Every year, millions of children experience traumatic events. 
with help, they can bounce back and recover. You can help change the course of a life. For tools and resources to help children recover and thrive, visit our website, samhsa.gov slash child dash trauma. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. All right, we're back on the Talk Back show and uh, ready to start taking some calls here. We have Raheel Raza on the line. And uh, Raheel, I'm going to pipe uh, Marilyn into the conversation here. Uh, Marilyn, thanks for calling in. Good morning. Um, okay, I appreciate your guest and want to respect what she has to say and everything. And, and, uh, but I, and I'm no fan of Donald Trump, okay? I just want to put that up there right front. And we'll have a very difficult time voting for him if he is, in fact, a nominee. But that, I don't believe that that's what he said. He said he wanted a moratorium. He wanted to, you know, stop, you know, put a pause on it right now because we've been letting people in over the, for many years, and he just wants to put a pause on it because we don't know who's here. And the new Syrian refugees, we don't have a way to vet them. Um, and the ones that are in the prison camp are usually not Christians. The Christians don't go to the, the refugee camps. I mean, they don't go to the refugee camps because they are always persecuted when they go in there. So, Marilyn, what's your question to uh, Rahil, please? Well, I just wanted to kind of... Um, well, make sure that, that make sure that she knows that he's not saying stop all Muslims forever. He well, just wants well, a moratorium. Let's, let's, a pause. Let's go, let's go to all something right. that Raheel said before, thanks, thanks which has nothing yeah. to do thanks with for your Trump. Call, which is okay, Raheel, so, would you elaborate about some things you said previously? Yes. Well, so, um, uh, in response to your caller, um, I do believe that uh, <clears throat> what Mr. Trump says is what is on people's minds, and, you know, he, some of the stuff he's saying is not entirely wrong. He just has a very crude way of addressing it. So one of the things we do in our work to reach out to people and have conversation is to say that we must have respectful conversations no matter how hard the topic is. And the topic of political Islam is extremely difficult to talk about. It's something that people don't want to. Now, polit uh, the, the politicization of Islam is called Islamism. This is why I said it's a totalitarian ideology. It is a recent construct, and there's been much written about it. Uh, we could talk all day, but very quickly, the first exponents of Islamism were the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt's Hassan al-Bana and Sayyid Qutb. In Iran, it was Ayatollah Khomeini, and in Pakistan, it was a man called Maulana Maududi. So the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, of Al-Qaeda, of the Wahhabi Salafi ideology from Saudi Arabia, and Khomeiniism from Iran, all constitute the politicization of the faith, which means that the spiritual message is sidelined. Now, the spiritual message of Islam, according to the scripture, is no different than the spiritual message of other Abrahamic faiths. It's about compassion and mercy and good deeds and good thoughts. But when it is politicized, then it becomes, uh, you know, intertwined with state government. And we talked about this a moment ago, you know, when there is no separation of uh, mosque and state, so to speak, in the, in the case of Islam. It's totalitarian politics. It's extremely anti-Semitic. It calls for no compromise. And basically, um, it is a war against the West. I, I and this to, is not something I'm saying. This is, has been declared by the Islamists. So ISIS are Islamists, Al-Qaeda, Taliban. Does, does that give you a bit of a definition of who the Islamists are? Yeah, it certainly does. I think probably the hardest thing for people to see is who is not one of the Islamists. Uh, you know, when, when, when you speak on behalf of the non-Islamist Islamic movement, um, it's hard for people to put you into a category with a bunch of other groups that they feel are safe. They, they f but yes, but you know, we are beyond labels and being categorized. For a long time, we used to call ourselves moderate Muslims, and then the Muslim Brotherhood started calling themselves moderates, and uh, you know, um, uh, ISIS was saying that they are moderate in their own way. So labels are very difficult, but I'll, I'll tell you where we, where, where we stand. We are reform-minded Muslims, and we have now started a reform movement, a Muslim reform movement. There's a website for it. And on it, we have a declaration in which we have very clearly 
noted what is it that makes us who we are and why are we different from the Islamists and the ISIS and Al-Qaeda because we call for Muslims to, for Islam to be brought into the 21st century we denounce armed jihad we denounce killing of people we denounce violence uh, we denounce sharia we denounce uh, you know we, we we support gender equality so all these factors is what makes us different from those who are uh, politically inspired and who want to create a caliphate and an Islamic state throughout the world. That is not what the silent majority who are sitting on the shelf want to do. The unfortunate part is that this silent majority of Muslims do not speak out and denounce the extremists, the radical Islamists, who are fighting a war against the West. And that is where the problem lies, and that is one of our biggest challenges. But we reform-minded Muslims are the frontline warriors in this battle against a radical, violent Islam. And the reason we use the term Islamist is because they are not ex-Muslims or non-Muslims. The extremists are very practicing, believing Muslims, but they have mutated the message. They have distorted the message. They use it to their own benefit, out of context. They use it to promote violence and not to spread peace and love. All right. Uh, we got to go to another break, but real quick, Bob, if you want to get your question in, and then we'll get an answer on the other side of the break. Rahil, when we come back from the break, I'd like you to answer what, in terms of your organization, are you doing to reach out to non-Islamic groups to build some partisanship and some understanding between what your message is? When you say non-Islamic, you mean... Uh, I'm talking just... about various groups, whether they be civic, whether they be religious groups that are non-Muslim. Uh, I know Rahil is involved deeply in this, and I'd like you to give us some examples. Got it. All right. Yeah. We'll We'll get that answer after the break. Also, we have Greg in queue. We can get your line, too. Call 721-1290. Good morning. This is Steve Darty with the Darty Law Office, bringing you Missoula's estate planning tip of the week. Ever wonder who would win a battle between your last will and testament and your other legal documents? Well, a deed trumps a will, as does a legal contract. So the beneficiary designations on your retirement accounts, your bank accounts, and on your life insurance policy will control over the provisions in your will. So contrary to your wishes as set forth in your will, there are other documents known as will substitutes that may invalidate portions or even all of your will. Have your estate plan reviewed every two years, if not more often. Remember, as your life changes, so should your estate plan. If you would like to know more, please visit my website, MissoulaEstateLaw.com. That's MissoulaEstateLaw.com. Thank you. This information is intended for educational purposes only and is not to be construed as legal advice. The Darty Law Office is located at 2620 Connery Way in Missoula, Montana. Hi, this is John and Mike Turner with, with Missoula, Missoula Car and Truck. And there's a good reason for our name. Right, right kids? kids? Yep, we've got cars and trucks. Here at Missoula Car and Truck, it's all about family. We've been family owned and operated since 1977. Whether you're looking for a classic used car or an ice cream truck, maybe you need a quality truck for work or want to replace that old beater with a newer car, we have just what you're looking for. Check out our inventory online at MissoulaCarAndTruck.com. Life is about spending time with family and friends and creating memories to last a lifetime. Your home is where your heart is and is the place to display a sense of who you are. Let Hoppers help you create a welcoming, comfortable home that represents you. Imagine entertaining your family and friends from your dream kitchen to your beautiful outdoor deck. Hoppers can make those dreams a reality. Hoppers, hopping to meet your every building need. Find Hoppers online at hopperscreations.com. Burn Street Bistro's latest and greatest weekend dinner menu is La Montaña Oaxaqueña. Featuring the foods of Oaxaca, Mexico, done the bistro way with house-made masa tortillas, pickled jalapeno rellanos, fried plantains, and mole of the week. Not to mention tres leches cake and orange flan for dessert. La Montaña Oaxaqueña menu is available for a limited time on Friday and Saturday evenings from 5 until 9 p.m. at Burn Street Bistro on Missoula's magnificent west side. Bounce and slide 
find your way through the craziest fun run you've done. Back in 2016 with even bigger, wilder obstacles than before. The Insane Inflatable 5K returns in just a few weeks and you and your crew are invited back to the bounce party. Bob and Weave to the Madhouse, <laughs> one of our most challenging new obstacles, and get your bounce on and slide on classics like Jump Around and Wrecking Balls. The celebration is on the midway afterwards and we have games, food, photo ops, and even more this year. The Insane Inflatable 5K is coming to Missoula on Sunday, May 8th at the University Golf Course on South Avenue. Presented by the Carl Tyler Auto Group and this station. This will be the only Insane Inflatable to come to Montana in 2016. So go to InsaneInflatable5K.com to register. Last year, Insane Inflatables took Missoula by storm with close to 2,000 runners participating in Montana's first Insane Inflatable 5K fun run ever. Check out all the new inflatables and register today at InsaneInflatable5K.com. See you on the course. All right, we're back on the Talk Back Show. We have Varahil Raza on the phone lines. Uh, we'll be taking your phone calls too. But first, I wanted to get an answer to Bob's question we had right before the break. He was wondering what sorts of groups you're working with and what sort of efforts you're making with those groups, whether they be civic or non Religion, non-Muslim religious groups, etc. You know, in our organization, uh, the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow and the Muslim Reform Movement, we have put out a request to everybody. We uh, we have always believed and said clearly that these problems are not ghettoized problems of the Muslim community only. In Canada, this is a Canadian issue. In America, this is an American issue. And unless everyone gets on board, it will never be solved. So we work with anyone willing to help us with our mandate. Our mandate is very clearly shown on our website. It's about outreach. It's about pluralism. On our advisory board, we have people from every faith community, and you know, people are welcome to go and check it out. We meet people of other faiths on a regular basis because we want to find out how did the Christian reform take place. It didn't happen overnight. It was harsh. Uh, it took a long time. We Muslims are just at the very tip and the beginning of our reform movement. So we need help. We want to ask people to join us, to help us, to uh, guide us, to advise us. So we work with everyone and anyone who is willing to support the change that needs to come. There are no borders there at all. And it is only through this collaboration with other groups, with other faiths, that the change is going to come. I believe that very sincerely. I am an advocate of, of dialogue between faiths, and unfortunately that dialogue gets stemmed again through political correctness. You know, we can't just sit around the table and talk about, you know, my, my celebration and your Christmas and Hanukkah. That's <laughs> not stuff. <laughs> we need to sit around and table and talk about the hard issues. Is there violence in other scriptures? Yes. I have sat with uh, ministers from the church and rabbis, and we find that, yes, there is violence in all, all scriptures. How have they dealt with it? How do we deal with it? Our Muslim uh, clergy, the religious leadership, has still not come down to the fact that they need to denounce some notions that existed in the 7th century. You know, we're dealing with this challenge where there are many Muslim organizations and mosques that, that think that we should be, you know, the, best, the only good Muslim is a 7th century Muslim. Well, no. We need to live in the 21st century. We are Canadians. We are Americans. We need to form an indig indigenous American Islamic identity, and in Canada, a Canadian Islamic identity for our youth. Right. I have two sons. You know, they've grown up here. They're... Muslim, but they are loyal to Canada, to the core. And they love hockey, no doubt. Absolutely That's love right. hockey. Yeah, I can Canadian. be Canadian and not How love that? hockey and maple syrup and, yes. and moose and, you know, all those <laughs> oh, yeah. wonderful things. Uh, so, so this is what I'm saying, that the narrative has to change. It, it cannot be a narrative of divide and rule. It cannot be or should not be a narrative of us and them. And, you know, let me mention, because you are so close to your elections, and I see that it's getting so rough, this is a nonpartisan issue. It doesn't matter who the candidate is. They should be interested in the safety and security of your land. These are lands that we call home. So everyone should be talking about these issues, but respectfully. All right. You know, uh, demonizing another community doesn't help. We got to get uh, a caller on. We have Greg, who's been waiting patiently. Um, Greg, thanks for calling in. Good morning, all. 
Uh, in many European countries, they are experiencing a nation within a nation. Uh, Sharia law is demanding a lifestyle, and uh, emergency services and civilians are not welcome within that area. How can we stop this, segre- this self-segregation? Uh, thanks for the call, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Greg. That's an excellent question, and you're absolutely right. In Britain, for example, there are 80 active Sharia courts operating. Now, this is where I also blame the government, because I'll come back to what I said. The change has to come from the grassroots, but also from the top down. Why did the uh, British government allow 80 Sharia courts to operate? Obviously, they're operating under their blessing. So we believe in one law for all, and we do not want Sharia courts and Sharia to be implemented in North America. I, I think we need to look at the example of what has happened in Europe, especially in France, and we want to ensure that that never happens here. So, Rahil, when you read, yes, I, I have to ask you this because in Canada, there's been issues in Canada in terms of the very same question that Greg brought up. So how has the Canadian government dealt with this Because multiculturalism has been, in many cases, a failure in Europe. So what have you learned in Canada that you're applying and doing differently? Well, in Canada also, the umbrella of multiculturalism is used for many, many nefarious activities because it is a a legal policy here. But, you know, our uh, organizations like mine, we speak out and say that all cultures are not equal. This doesn't mean that they are good or bad. But what we say, don't use culture as a use excuse for abuse of any kind. Uh, you know, there are cultures that don't respect their women. This is not equal to cultures that respect women. So definitely, multiculturalism has been a huge problem. But we have been able to overcome this in the 19th and um, around uh, late 19, uh, 1994 and 5 there was a huge debate in Ontario the province where I live about implementing Sharia law and we lobbied long and hard we had the year of the government and, and it took us one year but we managed to throw out the loophole within the legal system that allowed for arbitration which means for uh, you know, arbitration and uh, allowing a second layer of laws. One law for all is what we followed, and we actually managed to fight that. So this has to happen from the government. The government needs to be cognizant that you don't just give in to every kind of unreasonable accommodation. Uh, and at the same time, uh, citizens of countries like America and Canada I need to be loyal. Now, I will bring in the Islamic concept on this. Oh, hey, in Rahul, Islam, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I do need to hit a commercial break. Sorry to be the commercial sheriff here. Um, okay. But we'll, we'll get to those comments right after this break, okay? Okay. All right, thank you so much. So, my business depends on our phones. Well, at Blackfoot, we're known for reliable digital phone service. And I expect a crystal clear connection, advanced features, and a reasonable price. Our hosted IP solution is reliable and has no upfront cost. And don't push some one-size-fits-all bundle where I get advanced telephony, whatever that is, for a low price. Only to lay out piles of cash for For a a phone system that'll be out of date before you plug it in. No. What I need is a phone solution where... Where we maintain it and upgrade it. And I need it to be flexible. And scale like that as your business grows. And should I have an issue? You'll need to talk to a real person like a dedicated account executive who knows your business and can help you out. Yeah. That'd be me. Sounds like it. Get business voice and data services from people who get you. Switch to Blackfoot for business today. Learn how we can improve your phone system's performance by connecting with an account executive at blackfoot.com or call 866-541-5000. The mustard seed is open. Please excuse the construction in the parking lot, but know that there's still plenty of parking in front of JCPenney, right by the front doors of the mustard seed. As the mall moves forward with their expansion plan, the mustard seed continues to make it fresh. From old favorites like teriyaki and Osaka to new dishes like pad thai and Mongolian beef, the mustard seed is open for lunch, dinner, takeout and delivery, and happy hour every day at Southgate Mall, Missoula. 
gorgeous scenery, outdoor recreation, fun shopping, and Montana hospitality at its finest. It's all under one big sky in Cedar Lake, Montana. Find out more at CedarLakeChamber.com and visit the best little gift shop in Cedar Lake. Good times, gifts, and video for deeply slash prices. Yep, it's clearance time and savings are huge on t-shirts, dresses, jewelry, blouses, wallets, purses, night lights, and lots more. Save now at Good Times Gifts and Video. Open seven days a week. Highway 83 in City Lake. All right, we got Earth, Wind, and Fire for every transition today because I was cut it short and I like Earth, Wind, and Fire, so... (laughs) <laughs> That's what you get. We're back on the Talkback Show. Uh, we have Raheel Raza, and actually our phone lines are full. Before I go to the callers, though, Raheel, you had something you were in the middle of, right? I cut you off rudely right before we went to the break there. Yes, so I was talking about laws, and I wanted to mention for the benefit of your audience that it is a very Islamic concept. The Prophet Muhammad told the Muslims that you must follow the laws of the land where you live, unless you're forced to do something against directly against the faith. So it is very much part of uh, the spiritual concept of the faith to follow laws of the land and not to necessarily have, uh, you know, parallel laws. And Sharia is man-made laws which are very anti-women, anti-minorities, many harsh perspectives, and they are not divine laws. They were implemented a hundred years after the death of the Prophet. So there is Sharia, a personal Sharia, which all Muslims follow, which is how we live our lives, our interaction with each other, the kind of meat we eat, what we, what is allowed, what is not allowed. That's personal Sharia, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But Sharia as a governance system, we denounce in our Muslim reform movement. This is part of the reform that we want to bring. We want our religious leadership to denounce armed jihad, which was a 7th century concept. They want them to denounce Sharia as a form of government. And we can only light a fire under their feet because we are not the religious scholars. We are grassroots activists. All right. Uh, I want to get Tyler on, and then Catherine has a question, and uh, we'll try to get both of those as soon as we can. Uh, and then Laura is also in queue. So you're, you're going to be busy here. We're going we're gonna to milk okay. you for all the money that you're worth, I guess, today. I had my vitamins <laughs> this morning. <laughs> all right. Uh, starting with Tyler. Tyler, thanks so much for calling in. You're on the hair with uh, Rahil Raza. Hi. So there's a, there's a story today on drugs talking about Michigan and the influx there. Um, it, there talks about the numbers, and that's what a lot of us here have a difficult, um, a, a difficult time understanding and comprehending. You know, you've got um, the city of Missoula has just agreed to accept in 100 Syrian Muslims uh, refugees a year. Um, in Michigan, they they accept uh, 4,500. Um, refugees a year, and their numbers are going up. This year, they're looking at 5,100. Um, the problem that that I have is that the, the president of the United States comes out and says, "We want to take in 10,000," and then within three days, it's up to 80,000, and then uh, two days later, it's 100,000 a year. They say that they're sending 100 uh, refugees to Mo- Missoula a year now, or they want to. But the numbers, we all know, the numbers are going to be higher than that. So, Tyler, what, what are you, I, I'm very interested to know, what are you afraid of for you personally when you hear about these numbers coming in? Because you're referring to people from the Middle East, they're Muslim, they're Syrians. So what are you afraid of is going to happen to us here in Missoula, in Michigan, in the United States? But, well, look, Bob, we cannot, we cannot vet these people, Period. That, that is, the, that is the, the, the only explanation that you need, is that we cannot verify anybody is who they say they are. So until, until you can prove to everybody that we know exactly who each individual person is coming into this country, we need to stop it because of the fact that we don't know who we're letting in. I know for a fact we're going to get hit. We've got... We've got uh, Hellfire missiles getting smuggled into Portland, Oregon. We talked about that last week. But they didn't we've quite got, make it there, but they were trying, apparently. Right. We've got well, that's the ones that get found, right? That's that's what I'm talking about. Is that this stuff is slipping through everywhere? Like literally, our entire country is like a sponge, and everything is seeping into our country. We've got nuclear material coming in from Mexico. We've got missing uh, subs from North Korea. We've got Russians 
making deals with the Cubans and transferring, you know. So, yeah. uh, got it. Lot, lots of threats. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to give Raheel a chance to respond, right. okay? Thanks, so, thanks, thanks Tyler. Uh, thank you for that question. I think the government needs to be very cognizant of this. Uh, the fact is that when anyone comes as an immigrant to a new country, and I went through this as well, there are very, very stringent background checks. I mean, my great-grandfather was checked. I mean, I was checked like four generations <laughs> before I came, plus, you know, everything from age to medical. This is how immigrants are processed. So I believe that the refugees should go through the same kind of processing. They should go through the same kind of paperwork because, you know, there are immigrants coming to a new country, and that will help us out, uh, you know, uh, hopefully be able to weed out some of the problems. And so, this is something that the government needs to do. Rahil, we can't do it as citizens. Uh, Rahil, where, where did your family immigrate in from? From Pakistan. So it's my understanding that Syria and the U.S., that the data that we have on the individuals that are coming in from Syria is much less than we have had with many of these other countries that have been more open and more in direct relationship with the United States. And that's what makes the vetting process so hard. Is there, can you yes, speak, can it you is speak to that? it's extremely hard because you can't go to these countries that are war-torn countries and verify the background of many of these people. But still, you know, the government has strategies. They have ways of... of uh, you know, doing the work, they have to find a strategy around this. Otherwise, you know, there is going to be more and more angst and worry among the citizens. Now, in Canada, our Prime Minister has also vowed to take in large numbers of uh, Syrian refugees, and we are trying to tell him to slow the process. If there's no rush, they, they can do it slowly, they can do it over a period of time, but at the same time, maybe they should even think about taking in the Yazidi Christians who are being persecuted in the Middle East, who don't have a place to go. Sure. So we have some serious questions. What about the uh, Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, where it would be much easier for these Syrian refugees to assimilate and integrate because of the, the faith, the culture? But these countries don't want to take a single refugee because they don't want the same problem that we are talking about. <laughs> they have said clearly, I mean, you know, it's ironical. It, it's, yes. it's the ultimate uh, you know, not it in my backyard. so sad, it would be funny. But, you know, this is a frustration. Uh, I think one of the options would have been that Western countries, because they want to show humanitarian, humanitarianism, they could have offered money to the Muslim countries to take these Muslim refugees, whereas we could have taken the Christian refugees exactly for the same reason, that they would assimilate much easier, and their lives are under constant threat. Yeah, well, you don't have to look far. I mean, Libya can attest that nearby war-torn countries can really destabilize you, too, if things go too far. Uh, we got to go to a quick break. After that, Catherine has a question, or four, I don't know. Uh, she's got her list ready to go, and she's checking it twice. We'll get to those questions, and then Laura and Jonathan, another Jonathan, great. We'll get to them right after this quick break. Thank you. Right here. Yeah. And they're cuter than all get out. It's Chick Days at your local Murdoch's Ranch and Home Supply. Swing by Murdoch's with the kiddos for a quick peep. Uh, I mean, peek. <laughs> Murdoch's Chick experts to help you find feeders, starter food, brooder lamps, and coops to get your backyard flock going in very little time. You could produce your own fresh, healthy eggs. It's Chick Days going on now at Murdoch's. Visit Murdoch's.com today for more info. In the studio right now with Rad. What do we got cooking this week, bud? This week we're doing a traditional French bouillabaisse, but we replaced the wine with the Deacon Pale Ale from Selkirk Abbey Brew. Hey, we haul haul. Exactly. <laughs> bouillabaisse is a traditional fisherman stew that comes from the Mediterranean side of France. And we can get all the ingredients in the recipe online? You sure can. So MissoulaFM.com, this station's website, and you can also get all the ingredients down at Missoula Fresh Market. Hi, this is Chris at Translucent. We get asked a lot about proper maintenance for Montana extreme driving conditions every day. Most trips less than 10 miles, trips that include excessive idling, vehicle driven on dusty or gravel roads, the vehicle is frequently used for towing a trailer or using a carrier on top, all of which place undue stress on your vehicle. For more information or preventing maintenance inspections, see us at Translucent Auto Care on Highway 93 South or call 721-6109 for a free inspection. CHS Mountain West Cooperative is having a men's Wrangler jeans sale all this week. Take 20% off men's Wrangler jeans through Sunday. Check out their Facebook page for a chance to win a free pair of Wrangler jeans. Winner to be selected on Friday. Mountain West Co-op also carries men's Western sport coats, and they always have something on the clearance rack for men, women, and children. CHS Mountain West Co-op, North Reserve, Missoula.
Hey parents, are you tired of the hassle of planning your kids' birthday parties? Hosting a party at home is stressful and messy. This year, let Mismo Gymnastics' amazing team help set up, decorate, and run your birthday party. We do the work so you get to relax and enjoy. Parties include tons of awesome gym time, followed by food and presents. Best of all, we'll clean it all up when you're done. This year, skip the birthday party stress and book your party at Mismo Gymnastics. Call 728-0908 or visit MismoGym.com. I know you don't have time, but if you laid on the biomat, you would have more energy and reduced inflammation and seemingly more time too. Our body systems are taxed with pain, toxins, concerns, and illness. And the far infrared wave and negative ions gently and safely restore and strengthen, increasing mental and physical energy. Feeling relaxed with less pain is a good way to feel. Call to schedule your free 45-minute biomat session at Montana Compounding Pharmacy and Wellness Center, 111 North Dickens Avenue. All right, we're back on the talk back, feeling groovy as ever. And uh, we have uh, Catherine queued up, ready to rock and roll. Go ahead and ask your question, Catherine. Okay, and I, I'm wanting you to go back to the, the Muslim Reform- Reformation movement, yes. if I could, just for a second. Yes, please. Um, how much headway, if any, in the Middle East countries and North Africa um, and the Central Asian countries uh, is, is this organization... Um, making in, in connections with uh, other organizations that think the same way. Um, are, okay. you, are you also involved in, for instance, uh, working with the Kurds who are kind of under fire by all sides? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. By everybody. <laughs> so, so this is, um, at the moment, it is a, a North American and European project. We had 12 people from America, Canada, two imams uh, from Europe. And this was launched at the end, in, in December. So we are very, very new. We are very much in our first few, um, you know, steps. What we are trying to do is work within North America first because I think we have a serious problem here for our gener- next generation. So we are writing letters to mosques and Islamic organizations, sending them our declaration and saying, do you agree with this? We, our Facebook page has about 10,000 viewers and likes, and so... Uh, for both Muslims and non-Muslims, this is something that they are holding on to. In terms of the rest of the world, it will take time, and we need to find people who will take this up and and okay. run with it. And our hope is that, you know, while the change may not come overnight, we are slowly and steadily spreading the word into these countries where there is a great need. Uh, we actually are reaching out to the Kurds. I met the Kurdish uh, community when I was in Sweden. And I'll tell you, the Kurdish women are an example of the rest of the world. I have never in my life met such brave activist women who are, have taken on the Swedish government head on to bring about change in their communities. So yeah. and apparently I'm also taking, working with them. Apparently yes. taking ISIS head on, too. They, yes, they do their own military. I, I mean, when I met these women, I said, this is what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> hey, we got, we got to go to, uh, we got to go to Laura on the phone. Uh, let's see, line three. Okay, there we go. Laura, thank you so much for your patience. You're on the air with Raheel Raza. Thank you, and good morning. I just have one question for your guest. I've always been curious about how refugees, and especially uh, your guest, would identify herself. What adjectives would she use to identify herself? All right, thanks for your um, call. By the way, I'm not a refugee. I'm a very bona fide <laughs> Canadian immigrant, went through the whole process and citizenship. Uh, I would identify myself as a reform-minded Muslim. And, you know, our declaration very clearly identifies what we believe in, and that is the litmus test. Uh, you know, when I speak to Muslims, I ask them, are you for gender equal- equality? Are you for separation of uh, mosque and state? Uh, you know, are you willing to, to uh, you know, denounce the notion of armed jihad and Sharia as a governance. So whatever we have in our declaration, and I would invite you to go to the Muslim Reform Movement website, is what we believe in. So we call, we are not looking to reform the scripture. We are looking to reform the way Muslims practice, implement their faith in the 21st century. We want to bring Islam into the 21st century, which means that there need to be a lot of changes. <laughs> and those, uh, those changes, we don't, Raheel, don't, yeah. those changes, Raheel, I think have to come in many cases from women within those societies. So can you please give us uh, some examples of what's happening with various cultures 
that women are taking a more active role in? And would it be helpful if various organizations here in the United States that espouse women's rights and issues would be more vocal in their support? Because from my perspective, that's one thing that seems to be missing, especially when it comes to issues that may be a little bit delicate in the political correctness world. Yes, you're absolutely right. The Islamic organizations, the mosques, definitely need to give more power to the women. I mean, the mosques are a men's club. The women are not even allowed in the main section in most of the mosques. So, you know, giving women their uh, equal rights is going to be a long shot. But I do believe that the change is going to come from the women. You know, there was a documentary that was made two years ago called Honor Diaries, which was to expose honor-based violence in Muslim-majority societies made by women, enacted by women, narrated by women. These are activist women who have brought about so much change in the lives of Muslim women by just exposing the problems of female genital mutilation, of which there are thousands of cases in the United States and Canada which nobody wants to talk about, because as you say, this is a sensitive, delicate subject. But if we don't talk about these issues, they fester, and then they create a lashback which we are also facing because people are frustrated. So it is up to us as Muslim women to take the, the reins of this movement to talk about these issues, but of course we can't do it without the help and support of our male colleagues and our friends and our family. I would never be able to do what I do if it wasn't for the support of the men in my family. So we have to do it together, but there are women scholars who are, uh, you know, for example, the first woman who translated the Quran in 1400 years is, a, is an American woman of Fidanian origin. Uh, you know, this is revolutionary. So, Rahil, uh, are, when, w- are women's groups, though, in this country speaking up enough, or are they constrained by sometimes their political objectives, which then not allow them to speak as they need to to support various issues in the Islamic world relating to women? Well, I'll tell you very clearly, because I'm not at all politically correct, that the Western, feminist, that the Western feminist movements have been a huge disappointment. They will not touch us with a 10-foot pole because they have their own agendas. People ask me all the time, do you have support from the Western feminist movements? No, we don't, because they are, you know, pandering to the to the uh, governments and, and to the organizations, which are really part of the problem. So we Muslim women in North America, where we have the freedom to speak out, we have freedom of choice, we have freedom of voice, we have really no other, uh, it's, it's our ethical and moral responsibility to speak out. And I do this because for the future of the next generations of Muslims, I do this for the, the women in my uh, in my community, in my social circle. And this is where the change is coming. Right. I don't know if you're aware that the Oscar winner for the short documentary is a Pakistani woman who made a documentary about honor killings in Pakistan. And because of that documentary, the Prime Minister, for the first time since the creation of Pakistan, implemented a law right. against honor killings. Right. Really? Yes. Well, that's great. Yes. Hey, hey Raheel, we got to go to a break, so some more change is coming. We'll have Raheel back on the other side of this break. For our last segment, we have uh, Jonathan in the queue, and one line open, 721 721- 1290. Jonathan, uh, I want to get your name out there. It's an, it's an important one. We'll talk to you in just a second. Thank you. Spring is sprung. Get outside and enjoy that sunshine. And remember, if you get hurt or overdo it, the Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic is open seven days a week. For those unplanned injuries or when you're just not feeling great, visit the Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic at 2230 North Reserve in the Northgate Plaza. Community Medical Center Walk-In Clinic open seven days a week and they even offer x-rays so you can get answers right away. Located at 2230 North Reserve in the Northgate Plaza. Open every day to get you back where you belong. Locally owned Thomas Plaza. Plumbing and Heating has been on duty ready to help for over 30 years. You don't achieve that kind of success without tremendous customer service, quality products, honest prices, and a long list of referrals from happy customers. Thomas Plumbing takes on any size job, commercial or residential. And Thomas Plumbing carries 50-gallon Bradford White Energy Saver water heaters that are an amazing value. Same-day installation, free removal of your old one. To find out more about services and products, visit thomasplumbermt.com. All right, uh, little boogie wonderland as we transfer out of this segment. Uh, we have Raheel Raza on the phone line. She's graciously taking our calls. I have Jonathan in queue. Uh, we're going to get your call on. Um, you're ready to go, sir. Oh, yes, I am. I want to thank you for taking my call. And this is a really good topic that you have here about culture. Uh, if you was at the, There was a rally a couple of weeks ago down at Karis Park, and the mayor was there. 
and I'm not going to quote what he said, except that you can ask him. The mayor had a lot of good stuff to say. There was no chaos in his voice, and how he wanted. He thought this was a great move to support p- these people. And he talked about his past, and if you could you just ask him about his past personally, and you'll get a kick out of his past. And for me, I'm going to do everything I can to help the refugees because I think about the little kids that's coming here, and they're going to be in the middle of all these protests. So I, in my younger days, I was a little more, uh, I call it kick-ass, and I grew up, and uh, Missoula helped me to grow up, and I started out with Richard Butler wanting to move to Missoula. And you can just imagine what would have happened if he had moved to Missoula. There's a, you know, the Aryan Nation, and um, it was rough in those days. Today, sure. things have changed, and peace is coming to the world whether we like it or not. All and right. I just think, well, okay, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Did you have a question for Raheel before we... Uh, oh, yes, I, I do, actually. What, what's your concern for the... Actually, I just talked to the kids that's coming with the parents. You know, they don't ask to be here because they're coming with their parents. So what can we do to make it better for them? As, me as a person, what can I do to make it better for the, the families that's coming? Okay. Thank well, you. Thank you so much for that question. You know, it is okay. the kids that I think about. They're innocent and they need a, an opportunity to make a good life. Then, you know, talk to them, embrace them, make sure that they don't get into the hands of the extremist organizations, because one of the fears also is that many of these, um, you know, the mosques and the extremist organizations that are part of the problem are standing with their arms open to embrace many of the refugees and then, you know, brainwash them into their ideology. What these kids need to know is that they're in the land of freedom. They're here. They can do whatever they want. They have opportunities and education. You know, this is something that they can do whatever they want with their lives. This is what I tell my grandchildren, that, you know, live a good life and you can educate yourself and make a difference in the next generation. So the focus should be on you know, education, on knowledge, on vision, on loyalty to the land that they have come to. Uh, you know, this should be now home, because when you believe that this is your home, you don't want to harm it. Uh, Raheel, um, before we transfer out of uh, this episode, I, I wanted to ask you a question, and it has to do with the way that we talk about this issue in our political spectrum. Um, you know, it seems to me a lot of people are really upset at the way that Donald Trump has talked about the Muslim issue. But one of the things I found concerning for the last eight years was the timidness that President Obama has had about talking about Islamism and the threat it poses. Um, you seem to sound uh, at least a little bit more direct in your charges against Islamism. Do you feel that Western leaders need to stand up and start speaking more like you? Yes, they do. They are, and they don't necessarily have to speak like me, but they need to speak the truth. You know, this is important. It is our, as I said, moral and ethical responsibility. And I'm going to very quickly quote to you what the Arab philosopher Averos read, said. He said, ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to hate, and hate leads to violence. So we cannot be ignorant and unaware of what the problem is. And between these two extremes, there can be a balanced conversation. It doesn't have to be a conversation of hate and bigotry and demonization, but it has to be a truthful conversation about the problem within us. This is a problem within the house of Islam. It is radical Islamist ideology. And trust me, it harms more Muslims than it does non-Muslims. There are attacks against Muslims who believe in a different way. I have death threats, I have fatwas, I get hate mail. So, you know, we need the support of other communities, of ordinary citizens, but fanning the flames of us and them, fanning the flames of violence, makes us no better than the extremists. We cannot be extremists in our thinking. We have to have a balanced conversation, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As I said, there is the spiritual message of my faith that strengthens me, that gives me hope, that gives me courage, that makes me feel blessed to be a Muslim woman. And yet there is the political aspect of my faith, which, is, which disgusts me. And I feel my faith has been stolen, and we need to reclaim it. But we need everyone's help. I, in doing this. I wanted to ask you a question about that. You know, I come from, uh, my church is actually the Reformed Church. That's what we call ourselves. And in that Reformed movement, there was an ecumenical movement as well as a doctrinal movement away from another tradition, the Catholic Church, as they call it now. So I guess my question for you is, are you both types? Reformed, uh, ecumenical, and, um, I'm sorry, ecclesiastical yes. church yes. structure and doctrinally? Yes. 
absolutely. We have to be, because there's a lot, I mean, you know, it's rooted in the theology and in the doctrine, so there has to be discussion and debate. So this idea of discussion and debate was totally stemmed in the, you know, 17th century, so we haven't had much uh, reasonable logical debate. And the idea was that this is dogma, the Saudis, Wahhabis say, you know, this is what it is, and you follow it or you die. So that's not what it is. Islam is very diverse. People need to practice and pray any way they want. That's not an issue, and as long as they don't resort to violence and as long as they don't force their views on someone else. I mean, you know, Muslims are very different in their thinking. There are 72 denominations. There's different ways to follow the faith, and they should have the freedom to do that. In the big divide of Islam between the Shia and the Sunni, do you find that one of those groups um, finds your message a little more appealing than the other, or is it pretty much equally split, those that come into the Reformed fold? Well, it depends. You know, Sunnis are the large majority. There's 80 percent, and the Shias are the minority. But, of course, just as an FYI, I was born in a Sunni family. My husband is Shia. Our children are Sushi. So we have, uh, you know, what you would call technically a mixed marriage. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, the Shias, I find, are theolo- more theologically sound. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they have... Uh, a lot of the knowledge, the Sunnis are pretty rudderless in the sense that there is no leadership, and that that is one of the problems. So in that vacuum, uh, you have people like Al Qaeda, and you know they they come in ISIS because they then take on the leadership role, and because there's a vacuum in R- the youth, Rahil, they are Rahil, attracted to this. Yes, we are out of time. Thank you so much uh, for coming on, and Bob, thank My you pleasure. for your help, and Rahil, we'll have thank more you tomorrow. So much. We'll get you back for an hour and a half next time.